So my name is Katherine Hayhoe, and I am a climate scientist at Texas Tech University. As Katie mentioned, I have authored the second and the third and now the fourth national climate assessment. And I want to emphasize that this uh, presentation here is the amalgamation of the work of dozens of authors and hundreds to thousands of researchers. It is a high level look at what do we know about climate science today and where are we going from here? So I was one of the lead authors on the first volume of the fourth national climate assessment, which is also known as the Climate Science Special Report. Now, even though this was a US-based product, it is currently the most comprehensive summary of climate science in the world today, because so many aspects of climate change are global, of course. You can access this report online at science2017.globalchange.gov. But in brief, it is almost 500 pages. There were 51 authors. We included as authors, and it was also reviewed by 12 federal agencies, as well as a public review and a review by the National Academy of Sciences, which was 131 pages long. So next time you get a review on one of your papers that you've submitted and you think it's really long, just think of us. We had a 131 page review of a 500 page document. And that makes this not only the most comprehensive and up to date assessment of the science in the world today, but also one of the most thoroughly reviewed ones. This review was on par with what we see of big international assessments like IPCC, not individual journal articles. Yet despite the size of this report, we can summarize it in just one sentence. And here's the sentence. It's real, it's us, it's serious, and the window of time to prevent widespread dangerous impacts is closing fast. Now, if you're looking for something a little shorter than the full report, we do have an executive summary, which you can access on the website. It's only two pages. And we also uh, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. Four of us authors wrote this. and um, some additional authors wrote a piece in AGU EOS. So if you're looking for a very short summary of what we as the authors see as, as the high level, um, most important aspects of the report, you could check out our op-ed in the New York Times or um, this essay in AGU EOS. I also want to emphasize that there is a whole series of seminars coming up. And in the future, we are going to be looking at different software to present these seminars, which will allow more people to log in and allow us to instantaneously record and share as well afterwards. So I'm giving the big picture overview. And then next up is my talk colleague, Tom Knutson, who's talking about how can we detect and attribute events to human-induced climate change, which is really at the very cutting edge of climate science today. I'll talk about that a little bit, but if you want to go in more in depth, tune in for Tom's seminar next week. After that, we're going to be talking about a very current topic, droughts, floods, and wildfire, which we see, it seems like, every time we read the news these days. And then uh, my personal favorite section of the report, uh, favorite in terms of being a scientist, in terms of being a human, honestly, the scariest part of the report, surprises. What surprises could lurk in the climate system that we don't fully understand yet? And then we have um, Ben D'Angelo talking about mitigation. Um, what do we have to do to meet the Paris target? Is it possible? What would our emissions look like? Then we have Patrick Taylor talking about the Arctic, because of course the Arctic is like the canary in the coal mine when it comes to climate change. And then we have Billy Sweet talking about what's happening in the ocean. And really, I think the only reason we don't talk more about what's happening in the ocean is because we're not dolphins. What is happening in the ocean compared to what's happening on land, it's like we see the tip of the iceberg. Most of the biggest changes we're seeing are under the ocean, and of course they are affecting our coastlines, and that's what Billy will talk about. And then Don will wrap up with providing an overview of the entire document, and then of course in December we have the second half of the National Climate Assessment being released, which talks specifically about regions and about impacts. So that is what you have to look forward to over the next few weeks and months, which is a lot of information. This report though, this first volume of the National Climate Assessment, the Climate Science Special Report, talks about three things in my opinion. It talks about things that we've known for a very long time. It talks about things that we've learned more recently. And then it talks about things that we're just now learning and things that we are starting to figure out that we don't even know yet. That's always the most interesting, but also the most challenging. 
So what are some things that we have known already for a very long time? Well, we have known for a long time that our planet is warming. The first journal article was published in 1938, documenting the warming of the world in response to emissions of what they called carbonic acid back then due to burning fossil fuels. We know that one year could be cooler or warmer, that's weather, but we also know that decade by decade, our temperatures are marching up and up and up. Some places are warming faster than others, but on average, we are seeing these increases around the entire world. And this is a screenshot of a picture from our report, and I just wanted to point out that in the corner of every picture, they have links so you can immediately share it on social media, you can save it, and you can look for the full citations and references for all of our figures. So the website's really easy to use, and I would encourage you to definitely check it out. What else have we known for a long time? We have known for a long time that humans are in the driver's seat today when it comes to affecting our climate. Of course, solar radiation, changes in energy from the sun, volcanic eruptions, natural cycles, orbital cycles, of course those all affect climate. We know that they do and they've done so for millennia. But today we know that the human contribution dwarfs natural contributions. And in fact, this report concludes that there is no convincing alternative explanation supported by the evidence for the warming that we have seen over the past century. Our report also shows what we expect to happen depending on the choices that we make. Now you might say, well, you know, how is this something we've known for a long time? You're showing us results that are based on the latest set of scenarios on the latest global climate models. Yes, but the first estimates of how much the world would warm and even how much more faster the Arctic would warm compared to the rest of the world, based on basic physics calculated for a doubling and a tripling of carbon dioxide levels, those first calculations were done in the 1890s. That is how long we have known, approximately, how global temperature depends on carbon emissions. Today, of course, we've refined that to a certain extent, there's still a lot of uncertainty, though. There's an uncertainty in how the climate will respond. So in other words, in climate sensitivity, and that is indicated by the shaded areas on the right-hand figure. Those shaded areas are uncertainty due to, you know, if we produce so much carbon, how will the planet respond? But the even greater certainty, especially towards the end of the century, the greater uncertainty is in our choices. Look on the right-hand side. Look at the difference between our choices. Will we immediately reduce carbon emissions? Will we kind of slowly reduce for a couple of years and then take it seriously and start reducing? Or will we continue to grow? The biggest uncertainty, the further we go into the future, are the choices that we as humans make. And so in a sense, you know, people always say, well, could you t just tell me which of these colored lines is most likely? Because I want to plan for the future, and if you could just tell me which is most likely, then we could plan for that line, right? Well, it's a little bit like Schrodinger's cat. I know you probably weren't expecting quantum physics, but by documenting the impacts associated with a given scenario, by telling people, here's what's going to happen if we follow a higher scenario or a mid-high scenario or a lower scenario, we are in effect dynamically changing the probability of those scenarios. Why? Because if no one ever told you that smoking causes lung cancer, we'd probably all smoke. I mean, no, at least I would, to be honest. They say it's good for the nerves. If we didn't know that eating certain foods were bad for us, we would probably just eat them all the time, right? So the knowledge of the consequences of our choices actually changed the probability of our behavior. Sadly, not quite as much as we would like from a scientific perspective yet, but the very uh, probability of these scenarios is constantly in flux with every new piece of information that comes out and with every new extreme weather event that occurs too, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. And last but not least, we have known for a long time that the Arctic was on the front lines. I mentioned that the first calculations of how much the world would warm in response to carbon emissions were done in the 1890s. Well, that same scientist, Arrhenius, also calculated that the Arctic would warm much faster than the rest of the world due to the positive feedbacks, as we scientists call them, or more accurately, vicious cycles, as we humans would call them, related to melting ice and emissions of carbon and methane from previously frozen ground. So what we're seeing is that, yes, indeed, uh, Arctic sea ice is melting, and these are two satellite pictures compared from uh, 84 versus six, 2016, looking at the age of sea ice as well as the extent 
We're seeing the Greenland ice sheet is sh shrinking, snow covers being reduced, and what used to be permanently frozen ground is thawing. What have we learned more recently? More recently, we've been learning a lot about extremes. We know that we still get record cold temperatures today, as we do record highs. And one record cold doesn't indicate that the world isn't warming, just as one record high doesn't indicate that the world is, is warming. But what we do see is that the ratio between the number of record cold days and the number of record high days is changing. The warmer it gets, the more record highs were breaking, the less record lows were breaking. We're also seeing more frequent extreme heat and stronger and more frequent heat waves around the world. It isn't just temperature extremes, we're also seeing changes in precipitation, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But what I've done here is I've added a little asterisk to this sentence. Most of the words on these slides come directly out of the report itself part of our key messages that are at the top of every chapter, but I've added a little asterisk where we have more to add, even though this report was published about six months ago. And of course, what we have more to add right here is the fact that we are seeing record heat around the world. Now, this is a map of our, temperature, our temperatures um, the past week, and of course it's summer. So of course it's warm. We all know that. And of course we have heat waves in the summer. That's a natural part of life. But what we're seeing is we're seeing heat that is stronger, that is more frequent, and that is greater than what we have seen before. And this is a selection of uh, headlines from just this past week. I am Canadian. I grew up in a house in Toronto that didn't have air conditioning. But people are having to install air conditioning because we're not used to the type of heat that we're getting today. And I was actually in Canada for that heat. And they responded by... Um, shutting the roof of the baseball stadium, letting people sleep overnight in an air-conditioned baseball stadium, leaving the pools open until 1 in the morning so people could sit in the pool until, until 1 a.m. and then go home to their beds after it was cool. We're seeing these changes happening. And of course, one heat wave doesn't prove to climate change, just as one cold wave doesn't disprove it. But we're seeing an increased risk of these events getting stronger and more frequent around the world. One of our co-authors who is giving a seminar in two weeks, Mike Weiner, um, published a paper just this past June, so after this report came out, and based on this paper, he concluded that for California, the, the heat wave that they had recently, initial estimates suggest that, you know, heat waves happen in the summer, but it was exacerbated by a few degrees, and the frequency was increased by somewhere between about 20 to 50 times compared to what it would have been without human-induced change. We're also seeing changes in the frequency of heavy precipitation. And these are observed changes that you're looking at over here on the left. Observed changes from 1958 to 2016. Why is extreme precipitation changing? It's because in a warmer world, there's more evaporation and the, and the air holds more water vapor. So when a storm comes along, as they always do, there's more water vapor for those storms to pick up and dump on us. And that is why we are seeing such a strong increase in heavy precipitation around the entire world that has been formally attributed to human-induced warming. I think that paper came out um, about 10 years ago, I believe. So in the future, we expect these trends to continue. We expect high temperature uh, events to become more frequent and more severe. We expect extreme precipitation events to continue to increase. And, of course, if you've been following the headlines, uh, you know that we are seeing more and more indications of these events as well. Japan, India, flooding in Minnesota. Last year, a third of Bangladesh was underwater. The monsoon is a normal phenomena. The monsoon is natural. But we are seeing natural events being increased or exacerbated to the point where I really think these dice are one of the best analogies. You might have heard the one about baseball players and steroids, too. That's a good one, too. Think about it this way. A double six is always a chance of that killer heat wave or that devastating rain event. That's a double six and it occurs naturally. But what climate change is doing decade after decade is it's sneaking in and taking another one of those numbers and replacing it with a six. So all of a sudden our chances of rolling that double six have gone up. And then it's also taking one or two of them and replacing them with a seven. So all of a sudden our chances of rolling not just a double six but something even higher is increasing. That's one of the biggest ways that climate change is affecting us is through its impact on the magnitude and on the frequency of extreme events. A sobering conclusion that we found in our report is that 
Our climate models tend to underestimate the observed trends, especially in extreme precipitation. They do quite well for global average temperature. They do pretty well for average temperature in large regions. But when we start looking at extremes, we're finding that our climate models are, if anything, more systematically biased towards being too conservative than towards overestimating observed and projected changes. And to emphasize this idea of the dice, I don't know if you've seen this NOAA map, but if you haven't, you should go look it up because it's really fascinating. They have a list of weather and climate disasters for every state that have caused at least a billion dollars worth of damage since 1980. Now, this is a really interesting map because it's not 100% science, right? If you have a hurricane that hits an uninhabited part of the country or doesn't even come ashore, it could be the strongest hurricane ever recorded, but it wouldn't have any damages, right? Or very minimal damages. So what we're looking at here is the intersection between weather and climate events and their impact on people. And that is really the whole point of why we're even studying this. If climate change were a rampant issue on Jupiter, it would be interesting, but we wouldn't be having webinars where hundreds of people, you know, tried to join but unfortunately couldn't because our numbers were limited. We wouldn't be having these popular webinars. We wouldn't be having thousands of scientists and IPCC reports and national climate assessments if this were happening on Jupiter. We care about a changing climate because it affects us. And this shows that, interestingly, the state where I live, I live in Texas, Texas is the most vulnerable state to climate and weather disasters because we already naturally get it all. It may surprise you if, you if you aren't from Texas or you haven't lived here in the winter. We get blizzards and snowstorms and ice storms. We also, of course, get tornadoes and haboobs and dust storms and hail and super cell thunderstorms. We famously get hurricanes. We also get massive droughts. But again, why do we care about a changing climate? It's because it's taking those dice and it's weighting them against us. And so the more vulnerable we are naturally to these naturally occurring events, the greater the risk is that these events are gonna be exacerbated by a changing climate. What else are we learning more about today that we didn't know before a decade or two? We know that the frequency and the severity of these atmospheric rivers, if you live on the West Coast, you've heard of these probably, atmospheric rivers, rivers of water vapor in the sky, these atmospheric rivers are increasing and they don't just hit the US West Coast, they go all the way up to British Columbia as well. And we're also learning a lot about the connections between our weather and the Arctic. Now I know there's always a lot of articles in the newspaper whenever there's a polar vortex. There's a lot of media coverage because everybody's, oh my goodness, it's cold, it's winter, but it's cold, why is it so cold? We do know that our circulation in the mid latitudes has affected Arctic temperature and sea ice. There are definitely strong indications, and we cite the papers that talk about how the Arctic warming is affecting our weather patterns, but we know at this point that the jury is still out. In some cases, there isn't enough data. In some cases, there's conflicting information. We know that the entire planet is interconnected. We expect there to be connections and relationships between what's happening in the Arctic and what's happening down here. For specific events, we can sometimes actually point out the processes that are going on for those events, but in general, we still have a lot of work to do to really figure out how we're being affected by the Arctic, as well as how it's affecting us. And then finally, of course, we couldn't go on without talking about hurricanes. This is a picture of last season, and it is not photoshopped. This is one of those real pictures of three hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico and the South Atlantic at the same time. And so, of course, when we see a record-breaking season like we saw last time, the first thing people say is, well, aren't we seeing more hurricanes? And the answer actually is no. When we look long-term, and of course climate is the average of weather over at least 20 to 30 years, when we look long-term, we are not seeing a change in the overall number of hurricanes. And model projections of the future suggest that if anything, ultimately, we might possibly end up seeing a slight decrease in overall hurricane numbers. So then you might say, well, hang on, are you saying that climate change does not even affect hurricanes at all? No, I am not saying that. Climate change absolutely affects hurricanes in at least six ways that we know about. It doesn't make them more frequent, but here's what it does. The precipitation rates associated with hurricanes are increasing because there's more water vapor for those hurricanes to sweep up and dump on us. We're seeing that they are intensifying faster because they get their energy from where? 
from the ocean. And over 90% of the extra heat that is being trapped inside the Earth's climate system by our emissions of heat trapping gases, over 90% of that heat is going into the ocean where a lot of it is available to power stronger hurricanes. So hurricanes are intensifying faster. It's taking less time for them to ratchet up from a tropical storm to category two or four or five. They're also st more stronger storms. There's the same number, but a greater proportion of them are stronger. We're seeing, and this is a brand new paper that was just published by one of our authors, Jim Cawson, last month. You can see there's always lots of new science coming out. We're seeing the storms are moving slower, which is bad news because the slower the storms move, the more they can stay over one spot and dump more rain. And that means the greater the impacts on us if they're over land or near land. They're also getting bigger. And of course, sea level is rising. So that means that there's the potential for even greater storm surges along the coast because there's more water available for those hurricanes to push up on land. So are we seeing more frequent hurricanes? No. Is human-induced climate change affecting hurricanes? It absolutely is. And in fact, for Hurricane Harvey, there's a couple of papers that have come out so far. Of course, the jury is still out. There's still more work to be done. But summarizing the initial papers so far suggests that human-induced climate change made a hurricane like Harvey about three to three and a half times more frequent than it would have been otherwise. It increased the rainfall, the average three-day rainfall, it's estimated was increased by about 15%. But the total rainfall over the whole event, it's, increased, it's estimated, was increased by the best guess is 38%. So just stop for a second here again. Why do we care about Hurricane Harvey? Because it came ashore in one of the most densely populated areas in the Gulf of Mexico, the greater Houston area. Is this saying that the damages associated with Hurricane Harvey were likely enhanced by 38%? No, it's saying the rainfall was increased. Those numbers still have to be crunched, but when we look at it logically, we know that this likely means that a greater amount of the damages were enhanced by human-induced climate change because, you know, the first 10 inches, people are used to that. The damages aren't that much. The next 10 inches, well, you start to see the risks and the damages. And then when you get, you know, up to 30 inches, well, you're looking at some pretty serious consequences. But if you add 38 or 40 percent more rain on top of that, that's where you start to see the really devastating impacts where people who are outside the 500 year flood zone are underwater and they're completely unprepared. So this is why we care, because of the strong connection between events that occur naturally and the fact that there's so many of us, seven and a half billion of us, many of whom live directly in harm's way. Today, it's estimated there's already a 1% chance of a Harvey per year, so it's not a 1 in 800 year event, it's a 1 in 100 year event, and by the end of the century, it could be down to about a 1 in 6 year event, which is really unacceptably high compared, you know, when you consider the damages that occurred and are still occurring. So, so then we get to the last part, the kind of the fun part. What are we just now starting to understand or starting to understand that we don't understand? Well, we do understand sea level. You know, we know that sea level is rising and it's very simple because warmer water takes up more space, right? And of course, when land-based ice melts, all that water also flows into the ocean. So that's why the oceans are rising. But there's a lot of very new science happening related to sea level rise, specifically looking at ice sheet stability. And some very interesting paleoclimate studies looking at warm periods in the distant past have found that we weren't accounting for all the ways that ice sheets fragmented and melted during those warm periods because our models were not reproducing what happened a long time ago in those warm periods back in the paleoclimate times. And so through studying paleoclimate records, we learned that there were new mechanisms um, like ice cliff disintegration, that when we incorporate them into our projections actually increase the upper range of what we expect to happen this century. And so our report concluded that for higher scenarios, so if we continue to produce more and more and more heat trapping gases, global mean sea level rise exceeding eight feet by 2100 is physically possible, although we cannot assess the probability of that happening yet. And just a reminder, there's two thirds of the world's biggest cities within just a few feet of sea level and over 300 million people currently living in the immediate coastal zone as well. That's why we care about these issues.
Now, since this report was released, if you have sharp eyes, you noticed a little asterisk on the last slide. Since this report was released, uh, Billy Sweet, who is going to be giving a seminar in a few weeks, so you should absolutely tune in for that. Billy Sweet led a new study that showed that what they call sunny day or clear sky flooding is worsening, where it's flooding where there's no storm. It's just sea level rise combined with high tides. There's a new NASA study that came out just a month or two after this, this assessment was published, showing that sea level is now rising at twice the speed it was when the satellite record first began. And then, of course, there's lots of impact studies that are coming out looking at natural ecosystems, looking at coastal homes. And one study came out a couple months ago. It showed that already in the coastal zone in the United States, average home prices have dropped 7% already because of the increased risk associated with living in the coastal zone. So there is a direct connection between this physical science that we do and what it means for real people today. In fact, maybe even some of you listening to this, some of us, I, I live in a flood zone myself, um, and many of the people that we know. As I mentioned before, we know the oceans are absorbing more than 90% of the extra heat being trapped inside the climate system. They're also absorbing about 25 of the carbon, percent of the carbon dioxide that we emit. And what we don't often talk about, but we do in this report, is we don't just talk about acidification, we talk about the massive impacts that ocean warming is having on the ocean, and we talk about the impacts it's having on the oxygen levels in the ocean, because all life needs oxygen. It might not breathe it, it might take it in through its gills, but it needs oxygen. And we are seeing massive changes to the ocean that are very concerning. And the only reason we're not talking about these more, as I said before, is because we don't live in the ocean. If we did, if you're somebody like Jane Lubchenco or Sylvia Earle or uh, Alexandra Cousteau, if you're one of those people who do live in the ocean a lot of your life, then you are talking about this all the time because the changes we are seeing in the ocean are incredible and they are massive. And we have a whole chapter that talks specifically about this. But then, of course, there's the kicker. And the kicker is the fact that if you look at our carbon dioxide levels over the last 800,000 years, these are the ice age cycles, the warm periods and the cold periods where temperature and CO2 go up and down together. Our CO2 levels have now passed something that we haven't even seen in the history of, and this is important, the history of human civilization on our planet. Has CO2 been higher than 400 parts per million before? Yes. Were there people around? Were there trillions of dollars in infrastructure around? No. There were not. As far back as we can go in paleoclimate records, we have never seen this much carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere this fast. And that is why there are potentials for surprise. And if you want to learn more about those, Radley Horton will be giving a talk about possible surprises in the climate system in a few weeks. So not only are our CO2 levels high, but if we continue to increase our emissions, we would see levels of CO2 in the atmosphere that haven't been experienced for tens of millions of years. And as I just alluded to, our current emissions rate suggests there's no climate analog. And in our report, we said the last 50 million years, but that has since been updated in the last six months to say the last 100 million years. So we are truly conducting an unprecedented experiment with our planet. Inadvertent, but unprecedented. And then finally, in chapter 15, we end with this. Climate models, surprise, aren't perfect. We all know that, and especially those of us who work with climate models like I do, we know they're not perfect. We know that they do incorporate most of the important processes that can be well quantified. But here's the thing. If we're not exactly sure that we can put numbers and equations on a process, like, for example, methane emissions from permafrost, they're not necessarily in the models. We know that our models don't include all of the processes that can contribute to the feedbacks or the vicious cycles I mentioned, compound extreme events where we have heat and drought or, or flood happening at the same time, and abrupt or irreversible changes. So we can't rule out future changes outside the range that's projected by climate models, and even worse, the systematic tendency of the models to underestimate temperature change during warm paleoclimate conditions in the past suggests that climate models, if anything, are more likely to under rather than overestimate the amount of long-term future change. So 
people often say to me, and if you follow me on Twitter or social media, you'll see this, people are always saying to me every single day just about, oh, those climate models are biased. You know, they're always saying this is going to happen and it isn't. And my response to them is, well, yes, actually, I do study climate models and I know that they are biased. But they are biased if anything in general, of course, there's always exceptions, but in general, all told, when you look at the whole big picture, they are biased in the direction of being more likely to under rather than overestimate the amount of long-term change. So not what's going to happen over years to decades, but what's going to happen over centuries to millennia. So what can we do about this? For the first time, our report also includes a chapter that looks at mitigation, that looks at reducing carbon emissions. And we even put a number on what those carbon emissions would look like. And this figure here on the left-hand side comes from the really good Climate Tracker website. It doesn't come from our report, it comes from Climate Tracker, where it goes through each country and looks at each country's contributions. So it's a really interesting website, and you might want to check it out later, Climate Tracker, or Climate Action Tracker, I'm sorry. But what we found is that cumulative emissions, so not a given year, but total emissions, from the beginning of the industrial era to today, have to stay below about 800 gigatons to give us a two-thirds chance of preventing two degrees Celsius. Now, that's not so great. You know, if the airplane had a two-thirds chance of actually flying and not crashing, you probably wouldn't get on it, right? Two-thirds seems like not a very good chance to take with our only planet that we have to live on at this current time. Um, but, you know, we are conservative people as scientists, and so, you know, to have at least a two-third chance, we have to stay below about 800. Now, there is a wiggly line, a tilde, in front of the 800. Why is that? It's because there's a lot of uncertainty here related to the carbon cycle, related to how it's going to respond to the massive amounts of carbon that we're putting into the atmosphere at a rate that is unprecedented in the paleoclimate record. And so because of that, since we published our report, there have been a handful of papers that have come out. A couple of them say, no, that number is actually lower. And then a couple of them say, no, that number is actually higher. So there's still a lot of work being done on this exact number, but the bottom line is this. Even assuming that global emissions start to decline, following a lower scenario, we still only have, you know, maximum two decades worth of business as usual emissions before we're done. And you don't want to be done. You don't want to go to zero in 20 years. That's unrealistic. So that means that we have to continue to bend the curve even more. We have to reduce our emissions even more in order to spread them out over the whole century. And we note, too, that the way we've seen emissions changing over the past 15 to 20 years is not consistent with a, higher, a lower scenario. It's more consistent with a higher scenario. So this part of the analysis is, is really not good news. Um, I would say over the last year, one of the most frequent questions I've got is, what gives you hope? And I say to that, well, it's not the science that gives me hope. As you can see, this is not good news. In fact, I sometimes feel like Cassandra should be my middle name. What does give me hope is, that, is what people are doing in response to this. And that's really a lot of what Volume 2 is about, because there is tremendous action going on. Now, you might say, when we look at all this massive information that I've just kind of dumped on you, you might say when we look at all this information, well, we have to get out there and we have to educate people. If everybody just knew, if they just read this report, if they just understood that we've known for 150 years that humans produce heat-trapping gases that are causing the average temperature of the planet to warm, if we just knew that, if we just taught people that, we could fix this. And this is a map, if you're not familiar with the Yale Climate Communication Program, this is a fantastic map that they do of public opinion polling by congressional district or by county, and they have some maps for Canada too. Anything that is blue is less than 50% of people saying yes. Anything that is yellow is more than 50%. And of course, the darker the color, the more negative or the more positive it is. So you look at this and you say, well, clearly people just need more education to understand that global warming is caused by human activities. We say, and this is a, a, little, a little cartoon from our global weirding episode that is the most recommended episode we have, if they just knew the facts, they changed their mind, right? And if you're interested in more of the social science on that, go look for global weirding on YouTube and just watch this short little six minute video and it goes through the social science of people interacting with facts. But to give you a brief summary here, um, when I was asked uh, by the New York Times, you know, do you think this big report that you just devoted two years of your life to is going to change people's minds? I said, well, if somebody's already not on board with the science or they're just disengaged and they feel like it doesn't matter, 
more information about ocean acidification or the attribution of extreme weather events is not the most important thing that's going to change their minds. And Dan Cahan, also at Yale, has looked at how people with the highest degree of science literacy are not most concerned about climate change, rather, they're the most culturally polarized. Larry Hamilton at the University of New Hampshire has gone further. He's looked at, do people think climate change is happening now caused mainly by human activities? And then he's broken that out by level of education. Do they have some high school? Do they have some college? Are they graduates? Do they have a post-grad degree? The horrifying truth here is that our political affiliation determines our reaction to facts and can even cause us to dig in deeper and harder rather than change our minds. Why is that? It's because people don't really have a problem with the fundamental science that explains why climate is changing. Um, I was inter entertaining myself with a couple of my colleagues on Twitter the other day. Uh, we were going through all the different areas of science that would have to be wrong for climate not to be changing due to human activities. Um, Nonlinear fluid dynamics would have to be incorrect. Uh, our understanding of the vibrational and rotational bands of molecules in physical chemistry would have to be wrong. A lot of what we understand about thermodynamics would have to be incorrect. The basic science that our entire society is built on would have to be wrong. And people don't really have a problem with nonlinear fluid dynamics or with thermodynamics when it's designing airplanes or powering their fridge or their stove. So people don't really have a problem with the fundamental science that goes back to these guys here. What do people have a problem with? They have a problem with the idea that it matters to them. You thought that previous map was, you know, a lot of blue, people who don't agree with the science? This map is even darker blue. People who think global warming will harm them personally. Why? Because the number one image that we associate with the changing climate is an animal that very few people have seen in real life in the wild. Or if it is people, all too often in the past, this is changing, but in the past, it's been people who live far away. Not people who live in places where we've ever been, people who live on South Pacific Islands, for example, or up in the Arctic. Of course, the reality is, is that climate change is not distant. Climate change is here and climate change is now, and that is the entire point of the second half of the National Climate Assessment that is coming out in December. It is affecting each of us in the regions where we live in ways that matter today. And that is really one of the most important things that we can share with people. Because no matter where we live, we care about a changing climate because it takes the risks that we naturally face in the places where we live today, and it is exacerbating them, making them more frequent or more severe, or both. And it affects us whether we live on the Gulf and Atlantic coasts where sea level is rising and uh, coastal storms are becoming stronger and intensifying faster and they have more rainfall associated with them. It matters in western states where we aren't seeing more frequent wildfires, but they're burning greater and greater area due to hotter and drier conditions. It matters up in Alaska, where what used to be permanently frozen ground is thawing and crumbling and falling into the ocean, putting over 200 Native American villages at imminent risk in Alaska alone. It matters to us even down in Texas, where we always have droughts and we always have floods. That's part of life. But our floods are getting more frequent. Our droughts are getting stronger as it gets hotter. And we're seeing these changes again right here in the places where we live. So as John Holdren said, we have three choices. Mitigation, reducing our emissions, adaptation, preparing for a very different future, or suffering. We can no longer pick one of those because we are already doing some of each. The question is simply what the mix is going to be because the more we reduce our emissions, the less adaptation is required, and the less suffering there will ultimately be. And that is the bottom line when it comes to climate science, why we do it, why we study it, and why we want to talk about it with you. The bottom line is when it comes to a changing climate, the way forward is not to screech to a stop. The way forward is to understand that we can build our resilience to the risks that we already know exist. We can increase our resilience to the risks that we know are getting stronger or more frequent. And, and this is where our, our climate science comes in, we can even start to use some quantitative information to prepare for risks that we know are getting more intense. Because the bottom line is we are moving into the future. And today, in order to ensure a secure future for all of us, 
we need to incorporate climate change into almost every aspect of our planning today. Thank you.